That's why. Thank you for a moment to pause, to say la, to just say thank you. Thank you, God, that you've That's called us to know you in these dark and dangerous days. And this morning, as pastors, we get to pull away from the crowd. That's we get to retreat into the sanctuary. And we get to be reminded about how good and great you are. And how, oh God, we need you so very deeply. Now breathe on us, King of glory. Breathe on us. And we'll be mindful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In the name of Jesus, we all agree in prayer and say it, amen and amen. Turn to somebody and tell them, the Lord is good and worthy to be praised. Amen. If you'll open your conference booklets with me and pull out the lecture for this morning, it's entitled, The Dangers of the Last Days. The Dangers of the Last Days. Subtitle, Imposters Impose on the Illiterate. Imposters Impose on the Illiterate. Amen. Dangers of the Last Days. You can send in the rest of the team out there for me. Amen. We're going to have a slow, a slow process this morning. So if they'll all come in right now. It'll be a wonderful, wonderful time. Open your Bibles, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. Uh, if you don't have your scriptures with you, I took the liberty of printing them for you on your outline. And as we come to this morning's session, I want us to know that as pastors and as congregational leaders and deacons, we are living in the last days. These are very difficult days, very dangerous days. So it's important that as we uh, congregate at the Bible conference, we pay attention to what the Bible says, amen, amen, about these difficult days. On last night, we started off talking about the office of the pastor and what the standard was. And one of those things that we discussed, we, in this, we mentioned that he must watch over the soul of the church. Tonight, I want to tie, this morning, I want to tie that in. Sister Barlow, on that, not only must he watch over the souls of the church, but he must do it in dangerous days. Does that make, that make sense here? So as we walk through this passage, <clears throat> I think we'll find some truths that will arrest us. And I'm going to need your help in the lecture to read with me. I'll call on you to do that and to uh, nod with me <clears throat> when you find something that jumps out to you. Verse 6. They are the kind, Paul says who work their way into people's homes and they win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and control did you see that you should circle that word by many desires such women are forever following new teachings but they never understand the truth. And these teachers, he's talking about the ones that enter into their homes. They fight the truth just as Janus and Jambres fought against Moses. And their minds are depraved. And their faith is counterfeit. But they won't get away with this for long. Someday everyone will recognize what fools they are. And just as happened with Janice and Jambres. In today's lesson, which is your introduction, every believer needs to know what time it is when it comes to the last days. In other words, family, there will be terrible imposters imposing as men of faith that will deceive people. Many will be led astray. Can you say many? many? By their deceit. And this text exposes the imposters of the last days. Yeah. <clears throat> 
I want to go out on a limb and I want to say something. There's a great tragedy in our ranks today as pastors. We've gotten to the point where we don't like to call names in our pulpits. Mm, mm, mm. The names of those that are doing harm to your people. And for the sake of trying to be safe and politically correct, we won't say who the imposters are. And so your people never know. They can't watch Joel Osteen. Am I making sense? They won't know that watching Creflo Dollar is dangerous. They won't know that buying music or lessons from Joyce Myers can hurt you. They won't mind that liking T.D. Jakes on Facebook is not good. They won't, they won't know that, that Bishop Long is a fool. And you're not to follow imposters. Pastors, I stand before you pleading with you this morning. Paul wasn't afraid to call names. Don't you be afraid to call names. Why? Because in dangerous times, it takes courageous men. Can I say that again? In dangerous times, it takes courageous men to stand up and warn the congregation about imposters or wolves. I'd like to say something else here. First ladies, ministers' wives, Sunday school teachers, it takes courage to warn those you are teaching in the church about imposters. It takes courage to read the word of God, don't make it up, and give it to them straight. Are y'all listening here? You can't be afraid of what they're going to think about your Sunday school lesson. If you're reading from the Bible, read it and sit down. It'll say it all by itself. Am I making sense here? And as Paul is talking to Timothy, again, I remind you that Timothy now has the oversight of being the bishop in Ephesus. He's been called by Paul to implant pastors in churches all around the region. And so this letter of instruction is critical because he's going to, he wants to make sure that Timothy doesn't put men who are cowards in the preaching place. They must be men that understand the time. They must be men that understand how critical it is to love the flock of God in order to watch over the flock of God so that imposters don't harm the flock of God. Am I making sense? Three points today and I'm going to leave you alone. Number one, we want to lecture about religious imposters. Somebody say that with me. Number two, we want to talk about religious illiterates. Come on, say it like you mean it. Come on. And then the third we want to talk about is religious indignation. Religious imposters, religious illiterates, and religious indignation. Y'all keeping notes? Okay, there's a note packet in there for you and your outline is for you as well. He starts off in verse 6, Brother Jameson says, They are the kind. Look at that. He pauses Pastor Kroon to explain what kind they are. They're this kind. They work their way. Are you listening here? You know what it means to work your way somewhere. You got a scheme. You got a plan. You, you, you got, you're intentional about what you're doing. They, they, they're, they're, not making, they're not making mistakes about what they're saying in the pulpit. They put hours into that message. And they know just what to say to work their way. Am I making sense here? Where? Where are they working their way to? Into people's homes. Can I unpack that? Why in their homes? Because home is where you live. Yeah. Some of you, I'll never have the privilege to go into your home. But these guys have access into your home 24-7. Why? Because you watch them on cable. You got them on internet. 
You got them on your phones. Come on, talk to me. And wherever you rest and reside, that's where they want to be. And so they work their way into your life because they have a plan. And look what else the text says. They work their way into people's homes and they win. Somebody say win. win. They win the confidence. Mm. You know what that means, right? Of vulnerable women. The, the, the women say, I can trust Joyce Myers. Mm. I can trust Creflo Dollar. Yeah. I ain't heard T.D. Jake say nothing wrong to me. Hmm. No, that's right. All, all he talking about is woman thou art loose. What's wrong with that, Pastor? Am I, am I, am I making sense? Come on, Reverend. They work their way into the homes of, watch this now, and I, I'll underline it for you. Vulnerable women. Did you see that right there? Yeah. Now, why does he say this? Because he wants you to know there's something about the character of these ladies that they go after. In other words, it's a certain type of sister that they want to win, that they want to get their confidence. They're vulnerable. What? Vulnerable to the plight and the work of the enemy. They've got a market. And so they go after them. He, he explains more. What are they vulnerable? The vulnerable women who are burdened with what? Can I say more? Have you ever seen somebody burdened with guilt? And usually when you get burdened with guilt, it's because you've got a lifestyle that you're doing something you know God doesn't approve of. The guilt only comes to the one who is guilty of some behavior. But because they're guilty of their behavior, these teachers will allow them to hold on to their behavior. Mm. Not make you let them know what you're doing is wrong and you need to stop it. They validate their behavior. Are you with me here? And so it becomes easier to listen to them. The burden with guilt and then it says the guilt of sin and then their control. Look at that. You see that? Controlled by many, somebody say many, many, many desires. Uh, Pastor Lewis, these type of ladies won't sit at Rising Star. Because holiness is the standard. Some of y'all missed that. They won't sit at Sweet Home because holiness is the standard. They won't sit, they won't sit at New Beginnings because holiness is the standard. Am, am I making sense? And, 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 and we won't coddle or cradle their desires. Notice this under the first note section. The first thing we see in the verse, I unpacked some of it for you already, is that these imposters are crafty. They're smooth. They're, they're subtle. And they're what I call great deceivers. One of the greatest uh, imposters of today, I mentioned his name earlier, is Joel Osteen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Who Joel preaches a gospel uh, that is not written in the Holy Scriptures. He, he preaches a gospel for you to have your best life now. And that goes against everything that Jesus said. Jesus said, if a man follow me, let him first take up his cross, right? Where does the best life come in then? The cross has always been an instrument of torture and shame and suffering, which is a call to follow Jesus. Joel Osteen preaches another gospel. Am I making sense here? And they're crafty and they're subtle and they're smooth because who don't want to have a real good life? Who, who poor doesn't want to have a nice house in the bluffs? Are you listening here? And so he deliberately crafts his way into their homes. Point number two, we look under the note section, is uh, these, these imposters, they'll know what to say, Sister Tate. And not only that, they'll know how to say it. Have you ever heard him teach? He has more stories than he does Bible. Because he's not a Bible teacher. And who don't like a good story? Come on, talk to me. Everybody likes a hero or a heroine story. 
So there's no wonder why you can fill up a stadium. If all of us pastors went out and just told stories from this point on, we wouldn't have room to contain the crowds. Am I making sense? But the dangers of the last days, my family, they won't listen to the word, but they'll run for the stories. They know what to say and how to say it, uh, Dr. Coleman. And so their motives will be to establish relationships with people that they might gain their trust. Uh, the next bullet point is they'll prey on those who are vulnerable and in need of lots of attention. Lots of attention. These are needy people. Uh, they need spiritual leadership, guidance, affection, and are looking for the spectacular and the supernatural. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's why they flock to these type of teachers. Not only that, but they'll select women who are hurting and burdened down with life woes. Here's the application. In these times, pastors, people will be extremely desperate for spiritual leadership and signs from God. They'll be craving things to please themselves, but will be easily led astray by imposters like these. And their desires will make them vulnerable for words to satisfy their flesh. So they'll gladly follow people who tell them what they want to hear. That's the danger, the danger of these days and religious imposters. And I want to encourage you, pastors, keep your eye on the TV and keep your Bible open to the text. So that when you stand to preach, you are culturally relevant. You got to study to do that. You, you can't take shortcuts. There, there are no shortcuts to shepherding. Can I talk to myself? There are no easy messages. Because I didn't have time to get to it this week. There's no such time thing as I didn't have time to prepare. You're always preparing. Can I say more? When you're driving down 41, you're preparing. Because you're exegeting the culture. Sometimes you got to listen to Rush Limbaugh to be able to tell the Limbaugh how wrong he is. Am I making sense? We have to constantly be living in exegetical mode. Am I making sense here? Mm -hmm. So we can understand the culture. Why? Because religious imposters are out there. I'm getting ready to expose some just a minute here. CNN, Fox News, ABC, um, NBC, all of the stations, all of the entertainment. We sit between, if y'all notice, we sit between Hollywood and the gay capital of the country, San Francisco. We live in what's called as the Bible Belt of California. There ought to be some Bible readers in here. Are you listening here? Can I just let my hair down? Is it any wonder why God dropped you in the middle of two meccas of sin? It's coming across our airways from Hollywood and seeped into our culture from Frisco. But you are here as the voices of the valley to contend for the faith. What you mean you ain't got time to study? What you mean you ain't got time to exegete the culture? He put you here and dropped you in the midst of these two spears so you could sound the alarm. You ain't going to catch me complaining about my assignment in Fresno. Well, for God saw the need for somebody crazy to be here on this corner. God saw the need for somebody to yell in the valley of dry bones. God saw the need to call you to this place because you're the man for this assignment. Don't you go to complaining and be about nothing. If you knew you couldn't handle it, why did you come? In between Hollywood and San Francisco, God had need for somebody who would warn the culture. Can I tie it in? Who would rise to the status of nobility. Who would not, yes, apologize for being the pastor. 
who will not apologize for being married to his wife, who will not apologize for being straight all the way. Who will not be influenced by the TV crowd who said, I'm going to stand in my little bitty assignment and preach the gospel until the chief shepherd shows up and tarries his flock. We look at religious illiterates. The text unfolds for us something very interesting. Verse 7. Would you read it with me on your paper? Ready? Begin. Such women are forever following. Uh huh. But they never. Now look what he's talking about here. He's talking about those who have been deceptively uh, misled by imposters. He goes on to say that they are forever following. In other words, they didn't just happen to follow him one time. They're forever following them. In other words, this is their lifestyle. Can I say more? You, you see these sisters. You see them. They come to your church this week. They're in my church next week. And they're in that church next week. And they're hopping all around. And they claim that I just can't find one pastor. Are you with me here? But who they really follow is the one that has access to their homes. Am I making sense here? Watch what else he does. Look at the note section on the note section. We see here, we discover that in these times, religious people will be very illiterate. Now, I'm not, when I'm using the word illiterate, I'm not using it in a derogatory way. I'm using it in the definition that is meant to be used for. Illiterate simply means you don't know. You don't understand. And, and when, when we look at this, they will not know scripture or truth. And that's why they're forever doing what they're doing. But can I go out on a limb and say some more here? They don't want to know scripture. Yeah, yeah. And that's why they follow these imposters. The Bible clearly says it in this verse uh, up here. As a result of this tragedy, they'll follow new teachings. Not found in scripture. Am I making sense here? There's always a new teaching coming out. Every day in just a moment you're going to see one of this culture's greatest imposters. Who just started the world's largest church. Her name is Oprah Winfrey. I'm going to show you a clip and I want you to leave here disturbed at what you see. And the millions of followers that are following her straight into Hades. As we look at this fourth bullet point, they'll never understand the truth because their hearts will always be inclined to follow these new teachings. The application of this second point is that the tragedy of these days will be that they will have had the opportunity to receive truth, Reverend Tong, but will have rejected it because of the lie. Here's an example. Of, of what a modern day teacher looks like in our culture. We ready to show, let's roll the clip, daughter. Could you cut these last two lights out up here? and they conducted the first ever mass trance on March 17, 2008. What do they teach? Who you are requires no belief. Heaven is not a location, but refers to the inner realm of consciousness. The man on the cross is an archetypal image. He is every man and every woman. The leader's website teaches these lessons. My mind is part of God's. I am very holy. My holiness is my salvation. My salvation comes from me. Let me remember that there is no sin. Do not make the pathetic error of, quote, clinging to the old rugged cross, unquote. The only message of the crucifixion is that you can overcome the cross. Have you heard of this church? Or maybe its leader? Years ago, she denied Jesus is the only way. One of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way to live. And that we don't accept that there are diverse ways of being in the world. That there are millions of ways to be a human being. And, and many ways, no, many paths to... ...to what you call God. That her path might be something else, 
And when she gets there, she might call it the light. But her loving and her kindness and her generosity brings her, if it brings her to the same point that it brings you, it doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. And I guess the danger that could be in that, I mean, it, it sounds great on the onset, but if you really look at both sides, I it could possibly be just one way. What, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? You say there isn't only one way. There is one way and only one way, and that is through Jesus. There couldn't possibly be one way. You say there is. Today, she has turned her millions of adoring fans over to New Age doctrine. Christians are letting this into their homes and are being deceived. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to week number three of our New Earth web class. And again, I um, thank you, Eckhart Tolle, thank you for joining us as we bring students and seekers together to discuss our latest book club selection. Eckhart Tolle's, and we did something last week that was uh, unprecedented. You said it's never been done before on television where you just sit there in silence. I, I, and I thought a lot of people responded to the sense of connection from that. So you want to do that again? Yes. Let's do that again. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you're going to lead us in silence. And simply become aware that you are breathing. The air flows in and out and you feel yourself breathing. Air flows in and out. In reading books such as Tolley's, I've really op it's really opened my eyes up to a new way of thinking, a new form of spirituality that doesn't always align with the teachings of Christian Christianity. So my question is to you, Oprah, how have you reconciled these spiritual teachings with your Christian belief? I reconciled it because I was able to open my mind about the... Um, the absolute indescribable hugeness of that which we call God. Um, I took God out of the box because I grew up in the Baptist church and there were, you know, rules and, you know, belief systems and doctrine. And um, I happened to be uh, sitting in church in my late 20s and I was going to this church where you had to get there at, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning where you could get seed and a very uh, charismatic minister and everybody was just, you know, into the sermon and uh, this great uh, minister was preaching about how great God was and how omniscient and omnipresent and God is everything and then he said, and the Lord thy God is a jealous God and I was, you know, caught up in the rapture of that moment until he said jealous and something struck me just, and I was like, uh, I think about 27 or 28. I was thinking, God is all, God is on the present, God is all, and God's also jealous. Jealous, God is jealous of me. Um, and something about that didn't, didn't feel right in my spirit because I believe that God is love and that God is in all things. And so that's when the, the, the search for something more than doctrine uh, started to stir within me. And I love this quote that uh, Eckhart has. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes in uh, chapter one, where he says, man made God in his own image. The eternal, the infinite, and unnameable was reduced to a mental idol that you had to believe in and worship as my God or our God. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You are the consciousness in which the world appears. So you believe what happens to us in death when the body dies? You don't have a belief. I don't give it any thought. You don't. God, in the essence of all consciousness, isn't something to believe. God is. Yes. God is. And God is a feeling experience, not a believing experience. That's right. And if, if Cut the light on for me. Your religion is a believing experience. If God for you is still about a belief, then it's not truly God. Thank you. My point is, religious imposters will make their way into people like Miss Kelly's home in Illinois. And now, because it's Oprah, Miss Kelly has decided she's no longer going to follow the teachings of the local church. And Oprah introduces her into global worship where we're meditating and chanting all together in silence. 
And now Eckhart becomes the pastor of the world's largest church. And Oprah becomes one of his favorite members. Jesus has now been reduced down to the consciousness of man. There is no sin in that church. There is no putting God first. Notice her words.